Superman Space Age issue one. Mark Russell writing, Michael Allrad on the on the art. Uh, you read this, Matt? So yes, I, yes, I did. Um, so this is essentially a not not even a what if. It's a uh, almost a companion to the New Frontier, in that this is about the DC heroes if they started to come up in the actual sixties. Um, and so it, it starts in 1985 and it looks like earth's on its last legs and Superman, you know, goes up to space, gets the full view. Um, it looks like there's, you know, so, like a, like a field around earth and he jumps, he, you know, he, he goes down to the fortress, uh, of solitude, uh, and stuff's raining down on him. So it definitely looks like the end. Um, and uh, as he's in there, uh, Lois and John are there, and he's talking about what it what it means to be a hero, um, and that uh, you know sometimes sometimes that you know when like when a, a sailor's lost out at sea, uh, and he could just you know stick his head up enough to to shout he was here, um, to do that before plunging into the darkness is an act of heroism. And so, as it looks you know, like it's the end, it's What's interesting that, that uh, we're at a point now where John is being placed in stories that are meant to feel silver agey and things like that. Yeah. Where and it, and it fits. Yeah, right? it's just this is like, interesting because typically yeah. when they set stories in that kind of time period and they, they they tend to do it as if okay, it's like the silver age where all mm -hmm. of these extra characters didn't exist yet. But so it's interesting to right? see them kind of throw that in there. Yeah, so he's and he's a, a little kid in this. He's probably no more than seven or eight, and he's scared. And so you know, Clark grabs him, and they sit with Lois, and the fortress is coming down because it looks like they've made their home there. And then it jumps back to to 1963, and you know, Clark's living at Smallville with his dad, and he's doing farm work, and he's like, you know, I could have had this all done in like ten minutes. And Pa Kent's kind of like, it's it's not the work it's doing the work, right? It's like, yeah, you can do it, you know, um, you can do it all quick, but you're not going to learn the, the value of work without doing it. Um, and then says, do you want to do it quick or do you want it done right? Uh, and as they're sitting on the porch drinking a root beer, uh, Pa Kent tells a story of how he was in World War II in the, the Pacific and that, you know, he... Um, he kind of saw the worst of, of what humanity had to offer and that because Clark had told him you know he could do more he could save the world and that's where Pa brings up again are you going to save it right or save it quick um, and then that's what brings up the story of, of in the war and that they're on in these little islands and no one in Japan knows that the war is over um, you know they've been bombing them for weeks they're half, uh, half starved Half shell shocked, and you know some of the the Japanese soldiers are surrendering, but they're also you know um, surrender you know take taking out as many lives as they can upon surrender, which then makes the U.S. soldiers super jumpy because they're seeing their you know people get taken out, and so they, as they start going through these caves, they start looking for fire because the the Japanese soldiers are, are smoking before they die. Um, and that's where they learn that if they're soldiers or civilians and how to handle it differently. So Pa Kent's there and he sees a, a fire go up in this cave and he fires and it, he ends up killing a kid. Um, and it's, you know, Pa learning the cost of war and that the kid was, you know, he had a lighter to try to light his way to hide in the cave because the U S soldiers were coming. Um, and you know, he says that, that, you know, you see, the cost of life and it, it sticks with you forever, you know, and he talks about how he shipped out soon after that. Um, and so he talks about that, you know, right after that, Pa comes back and tries to get settled. And that's where Clark finds his way to them, uh, to him and Ma. And um, they just talk about how, you know, in that when he landed, there was also another piece that they kept going. And we know that's going to end up being, what becomes of the Fortress of Solitude. Um, and that it tells Clark to look at it. But as they're sitting on the porch, they get news from Dallas that JFK has been assassinated, which now inspires Clark to, you know, he wants to go do more. 
Uh, we get a meeting in Washington between Bruce Wayne and uh, Lex Luthor. They introduce themselves as representatives for their each of their companies, and they're going into a, a boardroom to meet with General Lane. Um, and they're told that Kennedy was assassinated as well. Uh, over the Arctic Ocean, uh, there's jets flying, and uh, they see Clark flying up, you know, towards towards the uh, Arctic, and and the pilot doesn't know what to make of this. Um, and we get cut to the you know stuff that's going on with Kennedy, uh, with them swearing in LBJ. And so it's cool that Russell's pulling from history. Um, but yeah, so, you know, Clark is trying to do more. Mom and dad don't want him to go. Uh, and then we cut to um, uh, the Soviets also see Clark as he's flying over the ocean. So the American pilots think that it's, it's something to do with the Soviets. The Soviets think that it's him. Um, and they get prepared to launch before this pilot fires at Clark and knocks him uh, basically into the snow. And so now that that thing's been destroyed, they stand down. So we get a near miss. So it's, it's really Mark Russell playing with the whole idea of the tension in the sixties. Um, and Lex is, is in a boardroom. Um, they're making pitches on how to deal with the cold war. And so Bruce makes a pitch that basically you can use armor and soldiers that are super well trained with, you know, essentially he's describing an army of Batman to go and fight in these proxy wars to keep tensions at ease. Because if you have a proxy war, they're not going to fight a bigger Cold War. They're not going to want to drop bombs. But then Lex counters with like, well, why don't we put all this money into bunkers? Because the war is going to be fought anyways. Um, why not, you know, plan for the end and come to find out when it, when it gets to the Pentagon, Lex has a guy in the inside that he's blackmailing. One of the generals has gambling debts that Lex has found out about. And that if he can get Lex's idea to pass, he'll, you know, you know, pay for all his debts. Um, Perry starts sending Lois out. Uh, she's running the uh, kooks and crazies beat. And so she's out there just talking to, you know, people that had, witnessed the Kennedy assassination and she's writing stuff up. Um, uh, Superman or Superman Clark finds the fortress. He finds recordings of, of Jor-El. jor starts, you know, trying to help him be um, Superman and tells him, you know, if you found this, you know, uh, fortress, your powers are going to be, I need you to go experience the world. Um, but he's telling Clark about stuff that he doesn't know that he can do. And this is really where the art, takes out that it's that Mike all red, very pulp style of like the sixties kind of like how, you know, Darwin's cook, Darwin cooks looked in the, the new frontier, just the very clean lines, but all red here uses the expressions of Clark. Cause he's totally confused um, about having heat vision or x-ray vision. He's finding about all the stuff. Cause as far as Clark's concerned, he's fast and he's strong and he can fly. Um, and he's going to, you know, have to unlock, all of these before he can claim his birthright uh, and basically be this emissary for other worlds and, you know, kind of a symbol of a world that, that didn't listen and, you know, consumed itself. Um, Lois writes a Pulitzer prize winning piece about the death of JFK. And then Clark moves from Smallville in 1964 to, to Metropolis and ends up working the same beat because Lois gets a, a promotion, um, a lot of fun 60s stuff. But on one of Clark's uh, outings on, on the Kooks and Crazies beat, he meets with Pariah, which I feel is weird considering everything that's going on with the Dark Crisis hmm. on Infinite Earths. And that he meets Clark in Bibbo's bar, which of course I love. Um, and... He tells him that, you know, he's he's from a world where he saw the destruction of everything and tells him how he unleashed the anti-monitor and that, you know, the Earth has 20 years. And 20 years from now, he's like, you can try to do, but it's going to end. I've seen it, which, again, I think is funny because we're talking about crisis and Russell's playing with a timeline, but we're getting all red drawing these these panels from crisis, which I think is really cool uh, in that style of the 60s. 
So like any monitor really looks monstrous and, and through all this. Um, and you know, but but Clark's like, well, we can we can change these things. And Prayer's like, you can do your best to to try, but nothing's in a, you know, it, it's all set into stone. It's and, funny how you can technically put Pariah in any else world story and kind of say it's tying yeah. into the the crisis event a little right? bit because. Well, technically, this is Pariah just traveling around the multiverse, and this is just right. one that's going to potentially die. So, okay. right, right, exactly. And so, um, uh, Lex ends up, you know, making his plan work. We also find out that that pilot. So, as as Lex is is getting his his idea bought up by by the general, he's blackmailing. The pilot comes in, and it's Hal Jordan, the one that had shot at Superman the year before. You know, he wants to know what you know. Um, you know, because they wanted to talk about this Soviet super weapon that he shot down that they didn't recognize. Uh, but Lois and Clark are hitting it off. They're, you know, he's trying to, you know, he tells her about Pariah and she's like, well, yeah, no, that dude's weird, but you get a lot of that. And she talks about her dad's experience in, in World War II, where he fought in the Europe side of things. And there's a bridge uh, outside of Belgium that both sides were fighting over. And there was massive casualties on both sides. But uh, finally, the American side finds out that the the Germans were holding an area behind the bridge. And uh, they're, the, they're able to take in the guys they were fighting at the bridge. When, he, when Sam Lane questions the other side's commander, he says, you know, no, we were, we were told that the American offensive was right on the other side. So they were just fighting over nothing, which again is another piece of this cold war um throughout the rest of the book we see lex and his you know his machinations and we see batman starting to you know since since they didn't buy up bruce wayne's idea you know he talks to lucius and they take it off book because even though they had paid for this research and development he can still you know well lucius you know is like well yeah in in a time of people writing history off books is a pretty good place to be uh, so we get the seeds for Superman. We got the seeds for Green Lantern, uh, and and now there's uh, so a Batman, Superman, and Green Lantern. Um, Clark keeps going back and forth between the um, fortress where he's talking to his dad and really forming his worldview in his uh, interactions with everybody. Um, Lois is taking you know bigger, dodgier stories. She ends up going down to the South where there's a lot of segregation stuff going on. Uh, it's the early '60s. Uh, and she meets with John Lewis uh, and learn, you know, learns about like she she asks him as they're in jail together because she got caught up in the protest about like, do you think that people don't care enough about your struggle because they're distracted? And John Lewis brings up that, well, no, before before we started doing the sit ins, we went went out and ate this Chinese dinner because we didn't know when we'd be able to eat again. So we ate as much as we could. And now we have this memory of unity before. And it, you know, it's that distraction that was able to, you know, distract us now. So it's very important. So again, it's Mark Russell using this history, you know, that you need the comics, you need the movies, you need music and all this other stuff in these times where everything feels like the worst, because it's those distractions that will help you keep pushing forward. Um, uh, of course, Clark comes down to help Lois and he ends up creating a distraction. Um, with because they they tell him the police that there's no Lois Lane there, there's no ladies in this jail, um, but he uses X-ray vision and sees her there. So he busts her out with the rest of the Freedom Riders and John Lewis. Um, it jumps forward another year on the Coast City Naval Base where, you know, Lex has built his bunkers and he says that they're going to test it out. Uh, so he was able to get through that crooked general. Um, uh, an atomic bomb and it looks like he's in the, the South Pacific they're going to drop the bomb and right as they get ready to a bomb drops on Coast City so the bomb that Lex said he was dropping you know, a thousand miles away actually drops on Coast City killing Sam Lane and everyone around there because Lex is trying to kick off World War 3 between the Soviets so that his bunker that he's built he can shape society now which everyone's looking at him like he's a maniac. Dr. Silas Stone is there. He tries to speak out against Lex. Lex gives him a severance. Um, and 
yeah, we, we get um, Hal Jordan going over Coast City in his plane. Ends up encountering Abin Sir. Let me see that. Uh, Alfred tells Bruce about Coast City's destruction. He goes down into the Bat Cave where now he has basically made the Batman gear. Um, and Superman finally puts on the suit that, you know, he feels he's ready for as he's, you know, lived in the world and he's, you know, learned to use his x-ray vision and, and heat vision and all of his powers. Uh, and they go to take in Lex. And so Batman ends up showing up there with Superman because Lex wants to drop the second bomb in Metropolis because um, they're, the United States ends up not retaliating. So Lex like, well, we have to force their hand um, to make it look like a second, and you know, a bigger deal. Um, but Batman and Superman show up, which then, you know, leads to um, the United States um, end up being hopeful because Superman had stopped this, all of this stuff from happening. He, you know, but just his presence there. Um, and it ends with Wonder Woman coming out at the United Nations um, and Bruce Wayne paying for a Hall of Justice and them uniting in the, the Hall of Justice. And that's the end of book one. Um, very, very, very long book. Well, it wasn't expecting all 80 pages to be packed, even though I should have because it's Mark Russell. That's kind of what he does. Um, but I, I definitely recommend reading it. It's, I feel like it is going to act as a companion to the new frontier in that it's playing with real world, you know, real world events to show why, not why superheroes are important, but you know, why these archetypes persist. And there, there's a part where Superman's rounding up the missiles that, you know, the, the U S and the Soviet are launching each other. And that's why there's been no retaliation because Superman's going through and stopping them. That's the part I kind of skipped over. Um, and he hides them all up on the moon. But, you know, he talks about that sometimes this era is called the space age. Other times it's called the nuclear age. He wanted to do his best to make it the space age, you know, because he wanted to kind of be his own deterrent. And, and yeah, again, super well written. Mark Russell really knows how to, how to do these type of, he has socially charged, not even socially charged, but these charged stories where they're playing with real life stuff. Uh, and then the all red art just fits perfectly like these dark lines. Each of the heroes looks, you know, like that era. So like the Batman, you know, his, his, his cape and his cowl and, and his suit look piecemeal. It doesn't look like a full solid mm. full piece. Cause it's all based off of the soldier stuff. And, you know, when green lantern shows up, it, it looks like that era. So, um, it, it, teases for volume two whenever that comes out we're gonna have flash there um so yeah it just feels like this is a a silver age you know smorgasbord and, and how that relates and if this you know what the end of the earth in 85 means is that is that the crisis right is this the thing that that ends this era right is this a meta story in that way or or what yeah, so I mean, but the... both is opposed because it's meta yeah. in the sense that that is kind of like, you know, where we transition to this other right? era. But also, right? in an unmeta way, if you take it literally, it's like, well, mm -hmm. all these other universes got destroyed in Crisis and Infinite Earths, and they made right? one true Earth, right? So, right? technically, this Holds Earth will all die, you know? Right. And that's it. Despite Superman's best effort, for, he's trying his best, but at the end of the day, he just has to know that he did enough. And that message right there, it really, really spoke to me, because that is... That's a Supermanism, right? Uh, and enough that, you know, do what you can. But the important thing is, is that you did, you know, not not necessarily the outcome. It's the effort that you put in. But, you know, it's really good stuff. So I'm going to give it an eight.